Sometimes I wonder if people designing coffee machines for offices have ever seen an espresso in real life. <laughs> That's my favorite. Your career is your own responsibility. Your employer is not your mother. <laughs> so I love that. That's from, from the guy. So, uh, and the reason I like that mainly the last one is because uh, software craftsmanship um, has completed 10, 10 years. Right, so last year in October was about 10 years of software craftsmanship. And, it's, and for me it's a pleasure to be here uh, today, first time in Milan, uh, to speak to the community and to, to meet you all. So thanks for having me, so it's a pleasure. So, okay, so what is this talk about? This, this thing is something that I'm slowly working on. Uh, the, the reason of this is I'm trying to find different ways of designing software, right? There are many different ways of designing software. There is no right or wrong. There are loads of pros and cons. There are loads of trade-offs. But design, mostly, uh, a lot, most of the methodologies focus a lot on state, right? On entities, on nouns, and things like that. Functional programming came in to, to to remember that state, uh, that behavior is also quite important, and not always every state needs to be important, right? So we can just pass things around. And, but, but design also takes many different levels. It can be like from all the way down to the name of a variable, and all the way up to like architecture, right? So design has many, many different levels. And most of my work in the past few years was on the micro level on the, the, the micro design, on the, the class, methods, variables, and stuff. And, but most of my work that I do now is more on the upper levels. And I would like to, to keep the theme, because I, I normally like focusing on behavior when I'm, when I'm designing. But as you move up to the, the, the higher levels, it's not so easy. But then we develop a few techniques. Some of them are ours. Others we adapt. Others we borrow from other people. Uh, but I would like to show to you a few techniques, right? So that, that we use with our clients in our projects. And as any other technique, it's a technique. It will be good in certain cases, and it will not be applicable in other cases. And nothing that I'm going to show to you here is a replacement for anything else. Are just different ways of doing things. Right? That's how I would like to, to conduct this. So. And before I, I, I start, I'd like to talk about bias. <coughs> An inclination or prejudice for, some, uh, for or against someone or something in a way that is considered unfair. And the reason that I say that is because we all have software design bias. Right, so similar to programming languages and other things, so project after project, we pick some design styles that we like, being layered, being hexagon, being microservice, monolith, whatever that is, and one way or another we make that work. Right, so yeah, it's a bit clunky here or there, but at the end of the day, it's, you make it work. And you do that again in other projects, in other projects, and then you just develop because you get better at applying some of these design techniques, and you build the bias towards that. Because now, the more you apply them, the, the easier it gets, even if you take different approaches. The same thing with almost everything in life. So the problem is that sometimes we, we get so comfortable in one style to the point that we reject the others. And that's where you cross the line. It, it's okay, we had this discussion earlier today, towards the end of the day, with one of the guys in the training. And the guy asked, uh, but don't you fear that if you always, for example, if you, if you like this way of designing, like, uh, you will miss out other ways of designing, right? So, so what I was trying to explain is that this is not right or wrong for some. I don't need to start from scratch all the time. 
And I think that it's fine to develop some biases. It's fine for you to, to have a set of tools, being programming languages, being uh, architectural styles, being whatever, that, that you rely on. That when you really need to get work done, you can go back to them and rely on them and, and, and move on. And sometimes you want to step back and say, you know what, like, let's try something different to look and explore. But I think that it's okay to develop eyes. What we cannot do is to overdo that and think that now everything else is shit. Right? So that, that's the, the, the finding this balance not always is easy. I'll give you some ideas uh, of different biases so, so you understand what I'm saying. Uh, and this by no means is uh, an attempt to capture all of them. But for example, you have procedural bias. You look at the code base and you see that they are very sequential. They normally, like in a procedural code, it follows the requirements. Like, so the requirements are stated in one way, you follow that in that way. You don't make a big effort to create domains and reuse code. You just say bang, 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 very imperative, bang, bang, bang. You find that. Does it work? Well, for a lot of people. Some people find it nice, some people don't find it nice. Data, for example, uh, was probably the first one that I had contact, well, procedure as well. But it was very data centric, like some, some, some of, my, of my design. I learned how to identify nouns first, right? So, and, and in fact, I'm lying. So, the first thing that we would do was to model the database. You would just analyze the data and how data relates to them. You come up with a data model that we used to call, and then we move outwards. Objects brought the, the nouns first, and then you first identify the nouns, and then you start finding the verbs and plug them together, and then they send messages to each other, uh, and so on and so forth. And functional, you think about composition, reusable. Uh, so, all of those things, when you look at them, they're not right or wrong, right? They're not like better or worse, sort of. <laughs> Everything has a limit, right? <laughs> I'm just trying to be polite, yeah. So, so exactly. Too British, right? So, uh, fuck it. This one sucks. This is shit. This is all right. This is what. So, yeah. Right? So, but the thing is, they are very different, right? So, the, the thing is, when you, for certain people, when you get used to one of those, make for this one and these ones now. They are at odds with each other, right? So, and they say, no, because this is much better, no, this is much better, no, this is better, what a... For whom, right? What is the criteria? And, and, and then I very rarely find some good arguments. It's more like it's my, it boils down to, it's my preference. Oh, but I have immutability, yeah, I can have it anywhere. Oh, but I have, yeah, you can also have that. Yeah, so you can apply a lot of design principles across all of those things. There are also architectural and, and operational bias as well. You find a lot of systems that people are, even if they don't have metrics, they don't have SLAs, they never discuss any of those things, but they need to, they code in a way that they need to extract every single millisecond of performance, and they think that they need to do certain things and work with pointers because they will have a performance issue. But like, what are you Compared now, no, this is not performance. According to what? I don't know, but like this, I just want to code this way. And, and you have all of these, and, and this includes CQRS, includes microservices, all this kind of stuff, right? So they are all biases. Can you make work things work with this? Yes, you can. But again, but the point of this talk is none of them. It's more of this one. Uh, what I'm trying to show to you is there are different types of uh, design biases, and, and they have different types of impacts. Right, this one is a very interesting one, because the, the, the previous two, ah. this one, for example, they normally impact one service, one deployable unit, right? So, well, the data, not so much, but like, when you look inside, a, a code base written in this style is significantly different from this style, right? That is significantly different from this style. So, there is an impact in there. And people that prefer one style or the other will find the other style almost unrecognizable, depending on your experience. And that's why sometimes it's so difficult to discuss design, because of our preferences, uh, back, uh, background, and everything else. This has a massive impact. These kind of biases are dangerous. Because the, the impact that, uh, when you are biased towards one of those things, the impact in your architecture, they're long-lasting. Right? So they don't impact just one deployable unit, they impact the whole ecosystem depending on which one you choose. This one, the, the, 
It's also is more, but that's the one that I want to talk about. It is a fascinating one because we very rarely look at these kind of things as, as an impact. And this is the direction that you choose to design. Most of these concepts in here, they are orthogonal to functional, to QOO, to data, orthogonal. So you can pick uh, any of direction. What do I mean by direction? First of all, you take persistence. You start from your, your data model, and you move to your domain model, to your business area, kind of a three-tier application. And then you move to, to your front. So, so basically, you do this inside out, well, not inside out, like what does the, from, from the, the end to, to the top. So this way of designing has an impact. It changes the shape of your system when you do these kind of things. The domain model is, is probably one of the most popular ones. Uh, so people will go straight to their core domain, and they will evolve their domain, and they will consider the, the, the edges, like being persistence, being other systems, being uh, the, the, the user interfaces, as a detail of implementation. And, but this also has an impact in your design. There's a lot of people that still do that, mainly mobile, with a lot of uh, very visual people, people that have uh, companies that have a lot of people in UX and stuff like that, so they're not designing a lot of uh, the user experience, their journey, and they start drawing from, from that uh, angle. And then there is outside in, that's the one that I, I want to talk. The direction is similar to this one. The only difference is more incremental. It's more like taking um, vertical slices of your domain, right? So normally starting from your API level, controller level, though we explore the, 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 the usability and, and what we want to provide to the external world. Uh, but this is, uh, we start from the, the back end moment. So it's interesting to see how it changes how you think about design. Because when you do that, Basically, the principle here is that nothing should be built if it's not to satisfy the external world. When you go domain first or even uh, persistence first, you already make a commitment to say, no, this is important. I don't know exactly how, but I know that it's part of my domain. I know. So you make a lot of speculation. Quite often, if you have good design skills, if you have access to good uh, business people, you might make some good assumptions in there and good decisions, but there is a lot of speculation as well. How much do you evolve your domain? How do you put those interfaces in place if you don't know exactly how it's going to be consumed? So there is some speculation in there, and we quite often find a lot of adapters and dispatchers and things like that because we create this perfect, beautiful domain that we don't want to touch now. So this one is different, oh, this one, because the domain is a side effect of what is needed from outside. So you start from outside first, and then you start evolving the layers. So this impacts your design. I'm not saying that it's better or worse, that's what I'm saying. But the way that you take, the direction that you take, impacts how the design the end result. So there are, when you are trying to, to talk about design, there's no single perspective that, you cannot just take one perspective, that's what I'm trying to say. Certain perspectives are more important than others. But for example, having an internal perspective, like analyzing data. Sometimes we, we just turn our no noses to, to this thing in here. Oh, this is very old school. Well, a lot of microservice architecture today, one of the biggest problems that they have is who owns the data? Now all these services are sharing databases and doing all this kind of crazy stuff because no one did any data analysis. So when you are trying to design something that is meaningful at a larger scale, you need to take multiple perspectives into account. But some perspectives might be more in, uh, important than others. Right? So the hexagonal architecture is a very interesting one. Right? So I've been thinking a lot about that. Have you seen a, a blog post from Simon Brown? Or have you read the Clean Architecture book from Uncle Bob? Very few hands. So the last chapter is written by Simon Brown, and he has a blog post about it. Before he wrote, he spoke to some of us. We already share ideas and stuff. The conceptually, the, the hexagonal architecture is very different from a layered architecture or component architecture, but in implementation details, they're very similar. Very, very similar. 
I would let you Google Simon Brown uh, hexagons, uh, layers, components. You find a blog post, you know what I'm talking about, because that's not what this talk is. But um, from this perspective, for example, we explore the domains, we explore the, 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 the business constraints, the environments, and everything else, and we consider everything else in detail. But from a user's perspective, that's a detail. From a UI perspective, that is a detail. So I have an issue because like, it's not exactly that you just plug stuff in, for example. You don't, yeah, you plug your database, you may plug even the, the connection to another system, but you don't plug a UI to it. That's a lie. It doesn't work exactly like that. The UI calls your domain, not that we run. You can put your adapters and dispatches, can do, but the relationship is not the same as the domain to the database or the domain to the UI. And, and there, are, there are lots of issues in here. But I think that this is a very important perspective. Um, what I don't like sometimes is when we just focus a lot about this, we spend some time here. One thing is to explore. I'll, 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 let's make a distinction here, because Alberto is here, I don't want you to start shouting at me. <laughs> so, <laughs> one thing is exploring. One thing is like, you know what? We are going to start the next milestone. And you want to explore a few ideas. Let's, let's bring some people together. Let's start throwing ideas. What if this happened? What would that happen? What would, should happen before? Let, let's explore. Let, let's brainstorm. That's one thing. Then there are certain techniques to do that. Another thing is when you already know roughly what the features that you need. Right? You already explored. You are now in a, in a backlog sort of phase. You are already refining your stories. And at that point, I sometimes have an issue to, to go start working from here when I already know roughly what we need to do because we create a lot of speculation. And when we start plugging the things coming from outside, we end up with this. Right? There's a lot of systems that I see that have layers and layers of adapters, of dispatchers, and all these kind of things completely unnecessary. And the only reason that they exist is because they wanted to do this first, and now they need to figure out a way to connect this and they are too uh, touchy about this, so they are, no, I don't want to change because this is so beautiful now. Then I don't want, so I'll put a fucking adapter in the middle. Right? And that's, I have an issue with that, because that's an accidental complexity. For the sake of it, right? So that's what accidental complexity is. So, there's no, of course, there's no agreement anywhere in, in IT, right? But like, this is how normally I divide the different layers of design. So at the very, very low level, class level, method level, collaboration of classes, I call this micro-design. Right? That's where, for me, where TDD really shines. That's where I use the different styles, classes used uh, outside in. It's more to flush out the details of each class, how they collaborate, which data goes where, and stuff. Then there is another level of, of abstraction in terms of design. That is the overall. Uh, organization of your service, your deployable units, let's put this one. And this is where you start thinking about dividing your uh, delivery mechanism from your core domain, if you're going to have hexagonal architecture, of course, and adapters, if you're going to have an infrastructure layer, if you're going inside your domain, if you're going to have components, uh, or this sort of stuff. So this kind of level, the structure, the, the, the backbone of, of, of the design of that uh, deployable units is what I call macro design. So as we start moving up in terms of level of abstraction, TDD becomes less useful to me. Right? Those are things that I prefer to think a little bit more. And then I will imagine, analyze a few features that I have. And then according to the, that knowledge, I will have a high level design. And then I might use TDD to test drive towards that vision. And if I find as I go along, that this is looking weird, then I will adapt to my vision. But I only have a, a wider plan. And then there is the outer side. That is how those uh, blocks talk to each other, these deployable units. And that's for me where architecture comes into play. And that for me, 3D is quite useless. I might write automated tests to test the performance, to test some, some accept, uh, acceptance tests or the general features. But I won't use 3D to derive the architecture. I might use automated tests in that normally I write afterwards. I build something and then I write my test list because I think it's easier. But that's just me. So another thing, the reason that I'm sh showing that, we, we gradually are migrating towards a more distributed architecture. 
right? So most people are now moving towards a more microservice approach. I don't like the term, but that's what people say, and, and that's fine. So what is important, like they're breaking apart their applications with the intention of gaining that business agility that you can deploy smaller parts of your application multiple times, which never happens because they suck at it. So, yeah. but, like, <laughs> but, but, but at least we are trying and I feel that it's the right direction, right? So the funny thing is that as we go for a, a more distributed application, concepts like hexagonal architecture or components or layer, they matter less. Because I know that face is Mm. <laughs> what do you mean? What I mean is because now my applications are smaller, the overall structure of the application is less important. If I had a very big application where loads of different components or bounded contexts or different domain concepts are all together, there are different uh, types of uh, delivery mechanisms coming in, it's talking to different types of persistence, it's talking to... So these internal structures makes it very important because there are too many concepts together, so I need to find a way to organize them properly and find the problems. But as soon as we start extracting those functional areas into different uh, services, so each one of them, the internal structure, if it's layered or, or exam, it, it, it becomes less relevant. It's still relevant, but not as relevant. So the smaller your service or deployable unit is, the less relevant the internal design is. So that's, that's how, how I feel. Which leads us to, 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 to a, a, an interesting point. If we are distributing our applications more and more, and the internal structure of our modules are becoming a little bit less relevant, but we are having more, for example, now what, what's happening with a distributed architecture is that before our bounded context or, or functional areas, or regardless which name you want to give to those things, they were all together in the same place. So that's those tactical uh, approaches to design uh, were important. Once you move them out, we are losing now that connection in terms of design. Because we are still focusing within the boxes, but we are losing the bigger picture now as we build more and more services. So my theory now is that we, the domain model, as we understand today, needs to go one level up. Domain modeling nowadays needs to take into consideration how distributed your application is. Because if you don't take that into account, we get to a distributed model. That's where, and I think that we are still, when we talk about domain modeling, we are, most of us, I'm not saying everyone, but most of us are still discussing if hexagonal is more important and this and that. I think that we need to move one level up. The problem is that organizing those microservices and these boundary contents in the separate deployable units are very difficult. And that leads to, to, to the real thing about this, this talk. I think that at the low level, we, we do okay, right? But we do worse as we move up. I would want to take outside into all the way outside, right? So not not just in the test level, class level. And I realize as I go to client, I've been a consultant for a very long time. And this has good and bad things about it, right? So the bad thing about it is that like, sometimes you don't have time enough to see the result of your decisions, and this sucks, because you don't know if that was a good advice or not. But you, it also exposes you to a lot of different problems, and you see many different ways of solving things, and, and try a lot of things, and this is cool. And I, and I stayed with permanent companies for quite a few years as well. But one, one thing that I, I realize is that we have a false impression that we work in an agile fashion. I don't want to make this about agile, but I want to explain the point. Today we have a very small interaction with the business, but we think, we, we lie to ourselves, not individually, but as companies, that we are close. Because now we have a product owner, we have a backlog, we have user stories, we have iterations and demos and stuff. The problem is, this is way too late. In terms of software architecture or high-level design, there is a lot of things that happens in product design, the whole strategy of the product, where we are going to go, which kind of market, should we buy software, should we remove software. So when it gets to the actual teams, there's tons of decisions, tons of complexity 
that were discussed in the product design level that we were not aware of. So the intersection between the business uh, direction of the product or the company and technology happens on the top items of our backlog. Do you work on agile fashion? Most of you? All right. So, so you have a backlog. Normally what you have, like, you have a backlog where the top items are more refined because that's the ones that you're going to carry on to, to the iteration, while the other ones are less refined. The problem is that we don't have the full visibility of where the product is going. So we only have this visibility. That is too small. And because we have this small visibility, we are very reactive in our architecture. It's okay for us to keep evolving gradually our classes and methods and packages, but not our architecture. So I cannot keep changing my architecture as soon as I discover something new in here. I need to have a, an overall picture of where we are going to start making some decisions. But because we don't have that, we are now going to, most companies will have a distributed monolith. Most companies that I know that went to microservices had problems because they cannot be strategic in that decision. They don't have the view, the connection between the two sides is not big enough. So, what I would like to do is to show to you a few things that we can do to really bring the two sides together because we cannot discuss architecture or high level design if you don't understand where the business is going. Because there is, are you familiar with Conway's law? Or the structure of the company past architecture? Much less so. so, this is the problem. We are always in the reactive mode. Right, so in order to avoid it or to have our systems to support the business direction and not be so reactive, we need to bring that close. Then there are a few techniques that we can use. So, for example, the real domain is outside, right, with your clients or other companies, depending if it's B2B, B2C, all this kind of stuff. So, at that high level is where they start talking about we as a company will create this product, or this service, or whatever. So this happens, do I have it? Click how I do So this happens here. That's when the original discussions about products happen. Someone at the very high executive level say like, this could be strategic, what if you tackle this market and stuff. We are certainly not involved in that. And then there are people from different functional areas in the company that might be involved in sales, marketing, and HR, or people in warehouses and whatever. We are also not involved. So, being, uh, uh, having access to the business just at the top level, we, we start working here. So I would like to go with, to work with the business at all that level, because for example, when they are discussing business strategy, we can help them to decide, do we need to build some software or we need to buy some software? We can say like, look, we might already have this kind of system somewhere else, maybe we could adapt that one. So this high level of architecture, this is very, very high level. Like UBS, the investment bank, had 27 confirmation systems. 27 systems doing the same thing. Oh, that was because of acquisitions and stuff. 170 front office systems capturing trades. So the amount of inefficiency that you have is gigantic. But if you are in one area and you just have access to the top backlog, how can you even visualize that? Right? So it's too late for you to be strategic. So I would like to start designing all the way at the top, talking about the solution that we're going to give all the way at the top, and then come down all the way to the class level as we go along. So we developed, as working with, with some of our clients, if you end up uh, in consultancy, you end up interacting at very different levels. You can talk about with C-level people all the way down to, to, to the people actually doing the work. Right? So, and, and we found that uh, different uh, techniques would help us a lot at different stages of our design. I'll show you some of the, the, te the, the real techniques that we used with some real data. Uh, but it's, it's fine, it's not me. I don't need my statistics. So one thing is the product box. The product box, this is not our tech, so we just adapt some of those things, right? So, product box is, is a great tool for you to start an idea. So, for example, at the very high level here, when they are discussing the idea of a product, or they are, you know, when you join a large organization and they have large systems and no one understands what the system does, right? So, there's no single person that can visualize the whole thing together. So this, this uh, exercise allows you to 
think to bring uh, people from different departments <coughs> and different backgrounds and say, like, imagine that we are creating a system, we're gonna burn in a, put in a CD and put in a shelf in a physical store. What would be the, the high level, uh, the bullet points that you would announce for your product? Right? So even if it's an internal product, I said, imagine that you are white, uh, white labeling it and you are selling to someone else. Right? It's fascinating to see how long it will take a, a small group of people, seven or eight people, that have been working in that company for five, six years, just to come up with ten items to describe their product. Mm -hmm. So, this is an e-commerce uh, company. And we asked them, I said, like, what does your system do? Why was this important for us to know to start with? Because if I need to come up with an architecture, I don't even understand what are all the different parts. And this allowed us, as soon as this, we, we finally, after two, three hours, create this list, we said, oh, we need to have only channel with sales over the web, mobile, physical stores. We have a catalog management per country. We have multi warehouse management and product and supplier management, orders management and support. So we had to guide them to, to make sure that the, 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 the language was in the same level uh, and stuff. And all of a sudden, in, in a, in a two-hour workshop, what you can have is a few candidates for what I call functional areas. Some people prefer more bounded context. I like to work in a higher level. There is more, I call it functional areas. So you can associate the two. What is fascinating is that some, some nouns or some areas come immediately out of that domain, right? So the catalog, the warehouse, the product supplies, they are, they are candidates, right? But those are areas that are important enough in their ecosystem to justify to be one of the main features of their system. And then we have things like basket. That was a surprise for us. But what led us to, to that was the omni-channel, because that experience of going to a website, adding stuff to your website, and going to a physical store, having your basket there, or your phone, having your basket there, was fascinating. This brings a whole complexity to the system uh, that we, we decided to to capture that. But this is, at a very high level, the first pass that you can have to identify the different areas of your system. Each one of those areas can have God knows how many services, right? God knows how much complexity, God knows how many teams working in them. But that's the first view at the very top. And at this level, what you can do, if you are in the early days of the project or you are trying to rebuild or refresh an existing product, you can talk to uh, people and you can start talking about architecture and say, hey, we already have a catalog system, or we can buy one, or we can reuse these. So what would be the approach? So we can start helping them with the architecture, with kind of profile of people, which kind of serves in this kind of stuff. This allows us, as soon as they pick some of the areas for us to work on, to be a little bit more strategic in the architecture as we start. Let me move on. So once we we have that understanding, then at some point, they want to say, you know what, this is our product. That's just the main features. We are not there yet. So then you can go one level down. This level down would be the next milestone. So for example, what we would like as a business to achieve in the next three months or four months, whatever the size of your milestone is, as long as it's not much more than that. So, so then you can have another workshop just exploring the milestone. Are you familiar with impact mapping from Goykwadze? Not. So, so basically, I'll give you a very concrete example and I'll show you real, uh, real impact mapping we've done. This was a very cool thing. There was this client that had like 18 million pounds of uh, investment and they wanted to build this big thing, but they wanted to, the stakeholders were very worried. They were a 12 people company, they ended up in almost 300 in a year and a half and then they crashed and burned and they don't exist anymore, so I can show. It was not our fault. We advised them for not to do certain things, but they don't exist anymore. So the, what they asked us in the first meeting, so like, we would like a plan. So what we, should be, what we should build in the next few months, which features would give us a higher impact, how do we identify bounded contents and high-level architecture, uh, how do we enable teams to work in parallel? How do we show a plan for action of our stakeholders? How do we reduce dependencies and plan for continuous delivery? You can answer that now. <laughs> That's right. 
So that was the first meeting with them. And I had CEO, CTO, uh, the main architect, one senior developer, the marketing person. That's I think that those were, and that was the match. And then we started to do impact mapping from Google. So impact mapping, normally you say, okay, let's plan. The investors wanted a plan. They wanted to make sure that they, the guys knew what they were doing. So okay, let's set a goal. So what do you want to achieve? Okay, so once you define that goal, the next level, so just defining this is, is very difficult. People can go on forever trying to define one single goal. And then the next level is like, who are the people or the partners or that could contribute to the goal? So let's find our main actors in there. Once you identify the actors, say, what is the kind of impact or the kind of behavior that you would like those actors to have in order to contribute to the goal? Up until level three is pure business. Level four is the actual deliverables. This is the actual software that you might build or change or buy or whatever, right? So this is how impact mapping works. So let me try to show you what you can do with it. No, not you, spoiler. <laughs> nah, not again. Okay. So, so the guy said, like, uh, in our next uh, three months, oh, well, the next goal for us in six months, we'd like to have 14 million users. As soon as they <laughs> say, <laughs> so, whatever, right? Take the number. As soon as they, it's what a few. 14, yeah, yeah, out of your hours, yeah, 14, <laughs> fine. Right. It's a lot, so, that's, so that, that's what is important, right? So, so then we said, okay, so who could contribute? This was interesting because like, they, they were uh, uh, a social network for music, right? They wanted to discuss music and, and, and stuff. So, so they had the fund, the people that like music, and they had the artists. I won't go into the detail because this has loads of business plan and stuff, but like, let's just focus on this two to keep it simple. So there are funds and artists. The goal was to have tons of users and make sure that the investors are happy. So then I say, okay, so what is the, the, the behavior that you want them to have? So let me just make this a little bit smaller. So there were two goals here. One is user acquisition, the other one is user retention, right? So you acquire users, but they need to stay in your platform. So then we started listing all the different kind of features that, or behaviors that we wanted those uh, actors to have. What was fascinating about that is that you bring the entire company together, right? Different people, different departments, developers, business and stuff, and everyone is looking at this with the same eyes. So there is a goal, there is art, uh, uh, actors and, and behavior. So then we start saying, oh, they need to sign up, they need to post content, listen to music, and then we said, right, now we start having, okay, for the next milestone, where do we start? So then we can start talking about uh, business according to value. So for example, in terms of bringing users, what if you had a, an artist sharing exclusive content? Can you imagine like a very famous artist that has millions of followers saying, hi, there's my, my new single will only be in this amazing platform, join. So, well, we have a great in, uh, amount of people joining in, but as soon as they join in, they need to do something. So they probably need to, uh, listen to music at the top, right? So, so then you start having this debate. And once you have that, then you can, on the next level, you can start thinking about all the things that you might need to build or reuse and stuff, right? This is a very big uh, impact mapping. If I open that, it, you see that it's, 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 it's huge. And then because it became uh, so big, what we told them is like, what if we, take all those features, and if you had to put group them into buckets, how would we call the bucket? And those are the names in brackets. Oh, this belongs to, so it took a long time for us to get there. So, and some of them are within the features as well, right? So then we start giving names to these things and grouping them. And as we were giving those names, we start capturing those names on the other side. And what was fascinating about this exercise is that uh, an exercise purely with the business, with the terminology mentioned by the business, across different areas of the company, we were able to start creating uh, functional areas that can be candidates of bounded contexts. 
And now we have, a, 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 going back to those questions, they say, look, if you want to focus in one of the, the, the activities, I don't know, uh, sign up, well, that will impact the user profile that might be there, the, the second one. So then we can start mapping, depending on which feature they want, which teams could work on it, would that have an impact somewhere else? Which kind of technology we could have, how we could architect our systems, and we could also take the whole strategy, technical strategy, go to our investor and say, we are investing your money on those features because those features will contribute to this goal. And I found this a fascinating exercise that starts helping us to go from very high level in the product box to lower levels and start refining those functional areas. I'll try to rush a little bit because... So the, the next level would be, once you understand uh, the goal and the features, then you can go one level down in your design. This is all high level design, right? So you are going from a very blocks and refining. So when you pick some of the features, you can take a, a, a cluster of features or features that are related to a single, a similar concept, and you start mapping a functional design. So basically, like you, you use, uh, you try, try to understand how the system will provide that feature to the external world, and you start mapping at the high level, uh, just a sequence diagram. So for example, if you want to provide a catalog of products, so basically the user goes and goes to the catalog. So what should happen? Ah, we need, we have products per country or certain images are not available in one country and is available in another. It needs to be available. Availability is a very complex uh, concept because it needs to be to know where, which warehouse it is. And then they start describing all the process. To display a list of products in the home page, there's a whole world of people that will belong, that will do things. And then we start trying to map that at a very high level. Oh, maybe there will be a product list and the catalog is a subset of it. And you start having this discussion. What is a catalog? What is a product? Is it a subset? Is it per country? Is it not per country? Is it, uh, what is available? What does it mean? Oh, there is a warehouse and stuff. And you start capturing that conversation at the business language at a very high level. With these, it gives you, you go through the scenarios. Oh, now I want to do, add something to my cart or to my basket. So there is a promotion thing. So this was a very interesting discussion. They wanted to, as soon as you add something to your basket, they want to honor that promotion, which means that even if you don't do the checkout and the promotion ends, and then in one week you do the checkout, they want to apply the same promotion. So that creates the connection to, from, from cart to promotions. What we were not expecting, there was an impact in our architecture. There were all can of forms, never worked well anyway. But uh, also, when if they go to the view cart, so what does it mean to view my basket? I need to have delivery options. Where do they come from? Ah, oh, there are different people in our organization that make deals with warehouses and people with vans and DHL. So, and you start understanding the flow when they describe something, and you capture this interaction, high level. It's not classes, no methods, just high level. And once you go through a few scenarios, for example, the, the, the checkout needs to display all this information. Which information we display? Uh, all of that, where do they come from? These, who is involved, who owns the data? And you start capturing that. The cool thing about that is, once you have this high level understanding of functional areas and how they relate to each other, you can start having a map so the green ones are all the functional areas that we expose directly to the external world, while the, the orange ones are the ones that they exist within the business, but they are not directly exposed. And once you have that, all of a sudden, all these candidates for bounded context and later on potential services, you can, before spending months, if not years of development, you can start having a, a view of your high-level system. So like, hey, maybe this catalog thing is talking to too many things. There's five connections in there. Should we have one functional area to talk to too many? Should we combine those functional areas? Should we split them? And this kind of logic. Should we have different people working on that? And then we start making decisions. I will move on. Once you have that, you can go one level down again. So now I understand where I am. I understand which kind of feature, the high-level feature that I want. So then you can start this is all coming from outside, all the way from outside, from clients, what you want to provide to the external world, refining, refining, always from the outside. So 
So now that I know the high level path of certain features, I need to flesh out the real pages, the APIs, the, the real services, right? So then what you can do, you can use mockups. So, for example, you can sit with someone with a, you, oh, sorry, it's not moving there. I know what I need to do. <coughs> no, that sucks. So, let me try again. Okay, so then what you can do, you can draw more cups for that feature. So, okay, so when I register, what happens? Oh, I, I can do a, a Twitter thing. So then a user will see its name, it will write something, and it will click post. Right, what do you want to happen? Oh, I will see all the, the tweets that uh, the person has. How do I have these people here? Oh, they need to follow someone. How do they follow someone? Well, they need to find them first. Right, so how do we do that? Oh, we need to find. And then we need to follow. And as I follow, so you start at a very high level. This is like a few hours. You just sketch the thing. So now we, are, we went from that high level flow to a more, slightly more precise level of detail. And what we can do with this, once we are happy, another thing that is very cool, you can take exactly that mock-up and start flushing out your API. So when we click on the register, what kind of data do you, are you going to send and what kind of data should we receive? So once I come in or log, or log in, what should I do when I post? What data should we send? So if I just want to see my timeline, what kind of data would I like to see? So with these interactions that you have in that UI, you start having an idea of what your APIs will be. The posts and gets and the data and stuff. And as you do this exercise, again, we haven't written a single line of code yet, but we are now having a very a strategy, an idea. So this will really speed up a lot of our process. Once you have that, then you can take like something like, uh, uh, what is it called? Swagger, mm -hmm. and then just document your API and blah, 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 that came from there, right? At that point, so you went from, you went from a very high level concept, this is the idea of a product, from the idea of a product, we went from the goals for our next milestone, and we narrowed down our understanding of functional areas. From that, we went one level down. So like, what are the main features? How would they <laughs> navigate through these functional areas? What are the dependents of those functional areas? We went one level down, fleshed out the detail of the flow to the API. And finally, we are ready to start writing code. And now we can use your favorite TDD approach, if it's outside in or, or plus this. I would still use outside in because I know exactly what my service should provide to the external world. What is the contract? So I drive from the contract inside uh, because for me it would be easier. And then you come into your outside in TDD, which I'm not going to go through in this talk, but that is the level of detail. But once again, once you come into the, this level of detail, this is more on the tactical side of the main driven design or interaction driven design. This is far less relevant, although it's a lot of fun because that's what we like doing, but it's far less relevant in the overall context of your design. So this is the, the whole thing. As I don't like hard numbers, so I don't want to, but I at least want to give an idea of what we do with our clients. For example, the product box, the high level view of the product, we like to do, depending on the clients, how fast they iterate, which stage their product is in, if it's early stage of the product where they iterate very fast, or it's a very mature product where they're just thinking about years. So we do every six to 12 months, we review the overall goals of the product, the main features of the product. The impact mapping we do every milestone, three to four months. Functional mapping, normally around once a month, we have, when you start the, we take like two or three iterations. What are the top items in my backlog? Let's explore a little bit how this looks like. It gives us an indication of which teams could work on it, which areas of the system is going to be touched, 
Do we need to build something before we build this feature? We can easy, easily visualize that. Mockups, depending on how intense, intensive your application is in terms of visuals, you might do every two weeks or never, right? So, NTDG databases, that's not really how we do. So, where do we go from here? I would like to close this gap. I wouldn't like this to be just the top of our backlog. I would like this intersection to be closer. But the only way that we can do that is if we provide to the business a way to collaborate. We cannot expect that the business will come to us and say, hey, I want to collaborate with you. Because they cannot see the value yet. They don't understand. Not their fault, by the way. There's a lot of, of things that I don't understand myself. But I know for sure that if I was involved earlier, while they are conceptually designing their ideas, I could provide good inputs, good technical inputs in terms of cost, in terms of effort, in terms of which teams, how many people, but I need to be involved earlier. And now I'm trying to develop, this is sketch of sketch of sketch, I'm still trying to think, I would like to map the cycles of pro product development or product design to cycles of software design. Right, so while we are creating a problem definition, we might have a solution context. So high level problems in the product, high level ideas in architecture. As you start coming down, okay, so now we have a few goals to the product. I might have a solution strategy. So it's getting more, a little bit more defined. As I have a few goals, I will start iterating on those goals. As I iterate on those goals, I start designing high level architecture for those goals. So basically, the level of our, uh, abstraction of the product design should go alongside the level of uh, abstraction of the architecture design or the, the software design. And that's what I'm trying to kind of map. So this is topic for potentially my next book. <laughs> if you are interested on the low level side, uh, on the design and TDD and class assist, Uncle Bob and I record 14 hours of video like doing class assists and, and outside in. Outside in is far better than class assist, there's no doubt. Right? So we, we, we sorted that. <laughs> so, no, it was a lot of fun and there's a lot of discussion between the two of us and pros and cons. There's no right or wrong, but you will see clearly the difference between the two stars. Right? If you go to the videos. All right, so that's it. Thank you. Question or whatever you want, just want to sleep. <laughs> okay, well, if you have any questions, I'll be around for a few minutes anyway. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, it's not even a like question, it's just like when I you know, say we're not trying to hurt me because of the DDD and the adapter and all this stuff, I see this as dysfunction. I mean, I've seen that too. And, uh, and it's not about DDD, it's about like what the stuff that you didn't get. Mm -hmm. like, like, uh, one of the things we found in some places, and it was co uh, correlated to the uh, to seeing the user behavior on the front end, it's just like, well, there is a language from the front end, which is the user language. Many people in DDD, they, they just don't get it because they talk with internal departments and they want the customer as a language and has a model and you are talking with that. And then that's one of the things that we've been missing. Yeah, and, and, uh, so I, yeah. I guess that, that that's an area where he, mm -hmm. yeah, fair on that. Okay. So, yeah. I also feel that is uh, that will be a long journey, you know, because the business side is not aware of this technique. So maybe as a community, we should uh, come out with an idea to share this with them, you know, um, because sometimes I feel that like I'm you know, the developer, that they throw me some input and I came up with some output. And I say, okay, but maybe if you could involve me. So, and, but it's, it's hard, you know? Yeah, the, a great, so he was saying, I, I need to repeat the question, so, well, not the question, but the, yeah. the sense, so he was saying that uh, sometimes you want to be involved with it, I'll summarize mm -hmm. what I understood that we want to be involved with the business, but the business doesn't have that awareness and they don't involve us, right? This yeah, and also we have different communication styles and different languages. Right, we have different communication styles. Different so, so this is true. Um, there are many sides to it. So 
I don't think that these people are evil or are against us, right? It's just a matter of like they don't see, they don't understand what we do. And because they don't understand what we do, they are busy the same way that we are. And, it's, and if I feel, for example, in what I do, that is building software, if I feel that someone doesn't understand what I do, or I don't understand what they do, I probably won't go there myself and say, hey, I don't understand what you do. I think that you don't understand what you do, but do you want to work with me? So you won't do that. Right? So this is a problem. So if you just wait, it's not going to happen. But what we need to find out, we need to volunteer, but we need to volunteer with some concrete options. So this is what I was trying to do, is to say, like, if I went there, if I had the opportunity to speak to them, as I normally have because of the kind of work I do, but I need to have something to offer as well. They need to feel that, you know what? It seems interesting what you're saying. I would like to explore this. But we need to be the ones proactive and pushing those exercises and explain to them, like, if you want, we notice there is a lot of uh, waste in our process, and we can speak to them, like, are you happy with our progress in technology? Most often than not, the answer will be no. Right? Because in their view, most often than not, they will think that we are very slow. They will have one feature, and they think, well, every time that I want one change, it takes three months. And there's always bugs. There's always... So, so what if we could go and say, like, you know what, all these frustrations we have, we might have a way to improve that. <coughs> Let's just talk. And then we can say, like, we can maybe run this workshop. This will help us to do this. This, but we need to try. But we need to know what the techniques are, right? So, yeah. uh, and I think that this is one of the ideas in this community is for me to come here and share some of my ideas. Some of them are like are from Goikos or from from other people, right? But develop these techniques, share with many people. So hopefully, some of you will take some of these techniques, evolve them yourselves, and publish them and stuff. And that's how we evolve. All right. So thank you. See you next time.